So I'm curious, have you ever had this experience where you're arguing with someone, you're fighting back and forth, you just can't understand each other, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, this person and I, we're using the same word, but we're using it to mean different things. Have you had that experience? So I think that that's what's happening in this case when we're talking about language deprivation in deaf and hard of hearing children. So the goal of this presentation is not to say that one definition, one use of the term is right and one is wrong. My goal is to highlight four different things that people might mean when they use the term language deprivation. My hope is that this is going to be helpful for all of you in understanding what people mean when they say this and also how to express yourselves more clearly. That's my first goal. My second goal is that I'd also like to discuss how the interpretation of the term language deprivation can change depending on whether you're talking about one person or a group of individuals. So a lot of this presentation today comes from my own perspective, it reflects my own opinion and experiences, and so I think you all deserve to know a little bit more about who I am and what I do. My training is really in psychology, specifically cognitive and developmental psychology. Currently, I work at Temple University as a professor in their Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders. And so most of my colleagues are clinicians. For example, they may be speech-language pathologists, audiologists, and so most of them are trained in thinking about one person at a time to meet their individualized needs. Now, at the same time, our department is housed under the College of Public Health. And so those people are trained in thinking about uh, a large group of, group of people and how to support all of them. So this makes for a very interesting mix of perspectives. And so I get to experience both sides of that, and I thought this would be a good topic for a presentation. My work as, as a researcher began with deaf adults and then it shifted to school-aged children, and now it's actually shifting even younger to focus on the period from birth to age five, because that time, those years, are so important for language acquisition. The name of our lab here is the First Language Foundations Lab, and that reflects our belief that language is really a strong foundation for the rest of child development. Our mission, as you can see here, is that we want to support the developmental potential of all deaf and hard of hearing children through both theoretical and applied research. And that's a pretty broad scope. For example, we study how parents, particularly hearing parents, make decisions about how to raise and support their deaf or hard of hearing child. And as part of that process, how they integrate their own beliefs and values how they integrate the advice that they might get from clinicians, and how they integrate research from uh, empirical work to make a fully informed decision. We also study how those decisions that parents make lead to different kinds of language input being available in the child's environment. And then we also study how that kind of input leads to language acquisition uh, in whatever languages the child is attempting to acquire. We study also how the child's proficiency in language leads to development in a variety of other domains, for example, cognition or social emotional skills or uh, learning to read and write, school readiness, all kinds of things. So all of that is what we do. Now, each of those four domains has a link to language deprivation, but that link works differently for each of them. And so that's really the content of this presentation, the main content. I wanna to explain to you how each of those four things reflects a different facet of language deprivation, but they are, they're all uh, distinct. So as you can see here, it's, something about environment or intent, environment, language skill, and long-term consequences. Each of these own, uh, each of these senses of language deprivation has their own meaning, but the way that language deprivation is used in the literature sometimes is quite ambiguous. 
It's unclear whether they are applying to one of these or all of them, so my goal is to uh, individuate those for you, and we'll step through each of those in turn. Starting with intent. Sometimes people use the phrase language deprivation, or signed in multiple ways, to describe the idea that a parent is intentionally withholding language from a child. The English word deprivation has that idea built into it, and the same is true for the ASL sign deprive or deprivation. I have seen this term being used to accuse of parents withholding speech from a, a deaf child. I've seen it used being uh, applied to parents withholding sign from a child. But one thing I've never seen is a parent who believes that that's actually what they're doing. Every parent that I have ever met actually believes that they are providing language. Nobody believes that they are withholding language. Still, this term is sometimes used to attribute intent. A second way that people use the term language deprivation is to talk about the language environment, to talk about what kind of input is available for the child to acquire. So when we're talking about what's in the environment, we're not talking about any choice or, or deliberate motivation or intent on the part of the parent. We're talking about what really is there in the environment. To really unpack this point, we need to distinguish between language exposure and language access. So let me show you what I mean. Language exposure is about what kinds of signals we are sending to a child. Whereas language access is talking about what kind of signals is that child receiving. So exposure, again, is about sending signals out. Access is about taking signals in, in a way that they sort of make it into the mind. So language exposure is necessary, but not sufficient. Language acquisition really depends on language access. Now for hearing children, exposure and access are typically the same, but for deaf and hard of hearing children, they are often not the same. So sometimes parents' intention is to provide lots of language exposure, but even when that happens, it's still possible that the child doesn't have access to that input, and so the environment doesn't contain the kind of input that is accessible to the child. So when people use the term language deprivation in this sense, that is sometimes what they're talking about. A third thing that people might mean when they talk about language deprivation is that we might be talking about the child's own proficiency in language, their fluency, their comprehension, the ease with which they use the language. Now, when we're talking about that, we're not talking about what's in the environment, and we are clearly not talking about what the parents were intending. We're really focusing on the child's own language skills. A fourth thing that people sometimes mean when they use the term language deprivation is talking about the long-term developmental outcomes or consequences in different domains that may depend on language, but are themselves distinct from language. For example, cognition or social-emotional development or reading and writing, mental health, physical health, quality of life, and many, many other things. So all of those domains do seem to depend on language, but they are dissociable from language or distinct from it. And again, this fourth thing, you know, it's, it's about the child, just like the third thing is, but it's not about the child's language, it's not about the child's environment, and it's not about the parent's intentions. So all of these uh, ideas are related, but distinct. This fourth point actually has another sub-categorization or sub-distinction, which you can see here. So there are, we can think about two kinds of long-term impacts. One is what we might call subclinical consequences. So these are less obvious things that you wouldn't necessarily see at first glance, uh, but they are still reflecting ways that a child is performing l less than their full potential. On the other hand, we're talking about language deprivation syndrome, which is a much more severe condition 
more easily detectable, where people have difficulty in many domains. Both of these are important, but not every deaf or hard of hearing child will have clinically significant language deprivation or even the more mild form. The concern is that too many children will have these. So, now we have reviewed the four things that people sometimes mean when they use the term language deprivation. But I don't want to depend solely on my own intuition or my own opinion. So I'd like to show you a, a brief study that we've conducted uh, to verify whether this is an appropriate interpretation. So we ran just a little informal, you know, not a fully detailed or fully fleshed out investigation, but an informal literature review. And I'll explain our approach walking through these steps. First, we looked at materials and articles, posts, essays, vlogs, for uh, anything that used the term language deprivation. We searched for that in English. And we collected materials like that from all over, from academic sources, non-academic sources online. After we gathered all of that information, then we began to filter it. So we eliminated things, for example, if they didn't have to do with deafness, it was eliminated. If they didn't actually use the term language deprivation, they were eliminated. Also, if they were written before 2010, if we had already had that article in our uh, collection. And at the end, that left us with 81 observations. We then took those 81 observations and classified them as belonging to three types of literature, either peer-reviewed literature, uh, gray literature, which means it was written by an expert uh, but didn't go through the peer review process, or it was written by you know, an expert or published by a professional organization that works in, in these areas, such as those listed here. And then the third category was everything else, and we were calling that lay literature. It just means sort of ordinary, something that anybody could write. So those were the three classifications. And then we coded those results. And if the article used language deprivation to refer to intentionality, anything sort of withholding or denying or depriving on purpose, then we checked yes for category one. If it was used to describe the child's environment, we checked yes for category two. If it was describing the child's language proficiency, it was a yes for category three. And if it was talking about long-term impact in other areas that were not specifically language, then we checked yes for four. If they used the term but did not provide any clue as to its meaning, we called that a zero. If they used the term to mean something that we didn't have listed, we gave that an X. And then if they used a term that meant uh, multiple things, that it included multiple senses, we rated each of those independently. Here are our research questions. First, we wanted to know, do people actually use all four senses that we've laid out here? And are they all equally common, or are some more common than others? Question two, in any given article, given use of the term, does it tend to use the term to mean exactly one thing, or does it use multiple meanings, or multiple meanings included in that one use? And then the third question, in our three types of literature, peer-reviewed, gray literature, or lay literature, do we see the same kinds of patterns? So here's what we see in answer to the first question. Do we see all four of those senses attested? Yes, we do. But if you notice, they're not all equally frequent. Interestingly, it's this first sense about intentionality that is least common. So although people still use this sign that depicts intentionality, that meaning is not really uh, often seen in the literature. Question two, 
within these results, we wanted to know whether they tend to settle on one meaning. And the answer to that is no. Actually, very interestingly, there's only very few articles that used language deprivation to express exactly one meaning. The rest of the articles either expressed multiple meanings, two, three, or four, or they didn't explain what they meant. The most common response, uh, the most common usage incorporated three different senses in, it, the, in using the term language deprivation. So as we know, there are these four different senses, and when articles used more than one sense, we asked which ones tend to get combined together. And so what jumps out right away is that senses two and three are very often combined. Sense two being about the language environment, and sense three being about the child's language proficiency. Those two are conflated most of the time, rather than the environment being considered separately from the child's proficiency. For question three, we wanted to know whether our three groups of literature, peer-reviewed, gray literature, or ordinary lay literature, showed similar patterns. And the answer was pretty much yes, in general. You can notice uh, that the peer-reviewed literature just tends to be, t tends to talk about more things in general, that the values there are higher, but the overall pattern within those values is quite similar across all three groups, meaning that it's not the case that academics somehow know better. No, they too are struggling with the same kinds of things. And likewise, when we look at uh, these plots, we see that all three types of literature are again showing the same tendencies. They are all not typically picking or using language deprivation to mean exactly one thing. They typically mean it to use multiple things. And all three types of literature tend to conflate the language environment with the child's language proficiency. So to summarize, Yes, all four senses of language deprivation are attested in the literature, but they are not equally frequent. Sense number one about intentionality is the least common. For number two, we found that most uses of the word language deprivation do incorporate multiple meanings, especially with respect to combining the language environment and the child's language proficiency. And then number three, the problems we found in 1 and 2, or the patterns we found in 1 and 2, are the same whether you're talking about peer-reviewed literature, gray literature, or lay literature. So now we're ready for the second part of this presentation. Earlier we talked about the four senses of language deprivation, and that is still important. But in this part, I want to point out that even if two people agree on what they're talking about, for example, if they both think they're talking about sense three, they can still misunderstand each other if one of them is talking about an individual and the other is talking about a population. And that tendency often uh, depends on the discipline that you're in and what you're used to doing. So for example, if you're a parent or if you're a clinician, you may be used to thinking about one child at a time. And that makes sense. It's a little bit like somebody who is thinking about one tree. But now suppose that you are somebody who is used to a role like being in research or public health or policy. Those kinds of people are accustomed to thinking about the whole forest. So now I wonder you know, it may seem like those two perspectives ought to be pretty similar, right? But I'm going to argue today that this interpretation is really important. I'm going to explain that in more depth. To do that, we need to take a little detour and talk about lead paint. And then I promise we're going to get back to deaf and hard of hearing children, okay?
So this graphic here is from the World Health Organization, and it's delivering a message that I'm sure all of you are already aware of, which is that lead paint is, you know, is toxic. But what you may not be aware of is how we figured that out. So I'm going to go ahead and share that story with you now. So Western medicine has known for a long time that lead has adverse health consequences. Back in the 1800s, we discovered that it had these really serious health effects, really major things. By the 1900s, we were beginning to discover slightly more mild impacts, but still pretty serious health problems. In the 1960s, we started discovering the link between lead and cognitive impairment, but lead wasn't banned until 1978. And so you may be wondering why. Well, the story has to do with this guy, whose name is Herbert Needleman. He realized that we may have been doing everything backwards. Up until he came along, the tradition was to study people who had really severe lead poisoning, so severe, in fact, that they would have been hospitalized because of it, and then when they get to the hospital, then we would study all of these other problems that were associated with the lead poisoning. What he realized is that we needed to look at what was happening before they got so poisoned that they needed to be taken to the hospital. Maybe lead was already having detrimental impacts on their lives that we were overlooking because we weren't studying these people prior to hospitalization. So he realized that we could measure lead content in people's baby teeth as they fell out. And so he collected baby teeth, crushed them, analyzed their lead content, and then found the bottom decile, the bottom 10% of children who had the least lead exposure, and the uh, top 10% of lead exposure among children who had not been poisoned enough to be hospitalized, and then compared the low lead levels to the high lead levels and measured their intelligence. So he compared the IQ scores of the low lead group and the high lead group. Now recall, as you know, that lead uh, IQ scores have an average of 100 in a typically healthy population. So go ahead and guess for me, what do you think the low IQ, or the, the IQ of the low lead group was on average? Go ahead and guess. It was 106. So now go ahead and guess what you think the average IQ score was of the group with high lead exposure. What do you think? Have you guessed? It's 102. So are you surprised? You may be surprised to know that the high lead exposure group had an IQ that's actually still a tiny bit above normal. It's really not that bad. So now maybe you're wondering, is, is that it? Why then did we ban lead paint? So that is a very good question. And to answer that question, that's going to lead us back to talking about deaf and hard of hearing children. First though, we need to talk a little bit about statistics. I apologize, but I'm going to do my best to explain. So IQ scores follow a normal distribution. By definition, 68% of scores are going to fall within this green area. But because we are not typically concerned about children with IQ scores that are higher than that, we tend to think and talk about children who are within or above the average range. So there really should be 84% of children in this green area. The kids who we're concerned about are in this lower tail in the red area, and there should only be 16% of scores in that area in a normal, healthy population. We would just expect no more than 16% of the scores to be there. So now I want you to see what happens if we shift the mean of the whole group just four points lower. We're not going to shift it radically, we're just going to um, take a four-point decrease 
just like we saw in the, I, uh, the lead paint example with the IQ scores. So when we shift the whole mean by four points, now we see that there's 23% of cases in that red area. Before it was 16%, now it's 23%. That means there's 1.45 times the risk, or in other words, a 45% increase in the risk of scoring in the red area. And that's pretty serious. Right? So that is why a four point shift in IQ was enough for us to ban lead paint. It's not really about the score of the average kid, 102 is still fine. It's really about if that whole distribution is shifted downward, that means that 45% more kids are going to be scoring in the red area, and that's the concern. So now suppose, let's just suppose that we didn't ban lead paint until there was a more severe shift in IQ. Suppose that we decided, eh, IQ of 102 is fine, we can tolerate that. We're going to wait to ban lead paint until the average IQ score is at the, at the end of the normal range, so which is a 15 point shift. You know, if we see that, then we'll ban lead paint. So here's what it would look like if we had waited until that point. If the average score was at the bottom end of the normal range, that means that half of the children, 50%, would be in the red area. And that would be having uh, three times the, the risk of scoring in the red area compared to a typically developing population. And we definitely don't want that. It's a 216% increase in risk. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about language scores in deaf and hard of hearing children. A lot of language assessments use the same kind of test structure as IQ tests. So in many language assessments, the average score is 100, and the average range goes from 85 to 115. And we should really only expect to see about 16% of scores below 85 in a normal and healthy population. So what do outcomes actually look like in deaf and hard of hearing children? Well, the first thing is we really don't actually know because we don't really have truly population-based data. We haven't really gone out to collect language outcomes at a population level and analyze them. But we do have some indications, we do have some data, and I'll show you two examples. We have two large-scale studies about deaf and hard of hearing children. And these studies measured language outcomes at or around school entry. The first study, the OCHL study, they focused on children who are hard of hearing, uh, so they used traditional hearing aids and their hearing levels were typically in the mild to severe range. And so what they found was that deaf, so excuse me, hard of hearing children had scores that were 14.3 points below hearing controls. So here's a, a graphical representation of what that looks like. And so as you notice, it means that these children are at three times the risk of, uh, compared with their typically hearing controls. In other words, a 204% increase in risk. The second study is the CDACI study, which stands for Child Development After Cochlear Implantation. And so that focused on children who were bilaterally deaf, who used at least one or perhaps two cochlear implants. And what they found was that the average outcomes for language assessment at early elementary schools looked like this. The Deaf children were 21.14 points below test norms. And that means that they were at four times the risk compared to the test norms. In other words, a 316% increase in risk. So what does all that mean? Well, I think it's really gonna depend on whether you're talking about a tree or a forest. For example, 
if you think about one tree, you could see how a clinician, for example, might have a, a fairly positive interpretation of all this. Notice that there really are a lot of deaf and he hard of hearing children in these green areas. It's not exactly rare. It happens quite often. And so I can understand how somebody with that perspective might have a positive interpretation, especially if they're comparing this to their previous experience where scoring in that area was much more rare. From this perspective, language deprivation is something that really only applies to the children who fall into the red area. The children in the green area, under this account, are not experiencing language deprivation. But if you are somebody who is thinking about the forest, then the idea of language deprivation applies to the entire group, not just the children in the red area. It also includes children in the green area. Because if the entire distribution has been shifted downward, that affects all of the children. It means that all of them are underperforming their true potential. And the goal is to shift the whole distribution back to the healthier direction. So that's, how, that's what I mean by your interpretation of language deprivation will really depend on whether you're talking about the tree or the forest. Another challenge is that it's not always clear, it's not always easy to tell if somebody is talking about a tree or a forest. For example, I'd like to show you a few quotes uh, from official organizations. The first is from ASHA, the American Speech and Hearing Association. So is this talking about a tree, one tree, or a forest? Let's also look at a second quote from NCHAM. So if we're thinking about a tree that is just one individual child, you could see how both of these quotes can, can be true. They, can be applied to these data. They may be a little bit vague, but you can see how they apply. But now, if we're thinking about the forest, it's a lot harder to see how those two quotes are really compatible with data like we see here. From that perspective, it comes across as a little bit more misleading. So, what now? Well, my primary objective in this presentation was to help all of you communicate more clearly, both when you're expressing yourselves and when you're understanding other people's interpretations, what they mean or what they don't mean when they're talking about language deprivation. So my hope is that next time you run up against somebody who's using this term, language deprivation, you'll be able to figure out exactly what their meaning is and if it's unclear, you might be able to help them figure out what their meaning is by sharing this framework with them. I'm hoping it's going to help all of us understand one another better. The second thing, you know, as I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about different famous environmental conservationists, people like John Muir or Rachel Carson, but really, I think the very best example I could find is from Dr. Seuss, the Lorax. The Lorax treasures each individual tree and cares for the forest together. I think we all need to imitate its example to care about both the individual trees and the forest. The third thing you can do is to find your needleman figure out what's happening in your state. Is somebody already doing population level outcomes analysis with language? If so, that's awesome. In that case, go ahead and figure out how those data are being used and support the idea of data sharing so that we can all learn from one another's achievements and challenges and mistakes. And if nothing is happening in your state, then it may be up to you to be the needleman. Maybe some of you are familiar with uh, the, the movement of LEAD-K, 
those states are shown here in yellow and purple, those are the ones that have passed lead K, that is taking a legislative approach to collect language outcomes data at a state level. But that's not the only approach. You may or may not know about uh, NECAP, the NECAP project, the National Early Childhood Assessment Project. Those states are shown in green as well as purple. So those states are doing pretty much the same thing, pretty close to the same thing as LEAD-K, but uh, without taking a, a approach that involves passing laws. The states that are in gray means that as far as I'm aware, they're not measuring language outcomes in the forest, so to speak. And so if you're in a gray state, I would encourage you to get in touch with your EDI coordinator or with other state level officials and ask, why not? What, what are the barriers here that are preventing this? Because understanding what the barriers are, the first step to getting past them. So that's it. I appreciate your attention. I hope you've learned something. If there's anything you'd like to follow up with me about, please go ahead and contact me, and I look forward to being in touch. Thank you.